everyone. Welcome to the latest presentation in 3ESI Intersight's webinar series. Streamline your planning, key considerations when building asset development models. Thanks for joining us. My name is Kendra Ravoy, Marketing Specialist with 3ESI Intersight, and here with me today is your presenter, Josh Byerly, who is a Senior Solutions Consultant at 3ESI Intersight. As a Solutions Consultant, Josh is responsible for working with clients to identify appropriate solutions based on their business goals, then becomes an integral part of the implementation process. Josh's past experience includes working as a development engineer, as well as a reservoir engineer for a large Canadian oil and gas company. During the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to take advantage of the chat window available through WebEx, and we'll address those questions at the end. If we can't get around to your question, we'll be sure to reach out to you at a later date. Or, if you have any questions after the presentation, don't hesitate to email me directly, kendra.ravoy at 3esi-entersite.com. Now that we know a little more about our presenter and the process for today's webinar, I'd like to hand it off to Josh for the remainder of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Kendra, and thank you all for taking the time to tune into this webinar. What I'm hoping to accomplish today is give you some things to consider before you build an asset development model. I wouldn't say we'll be going over anything groundbreaking, but in my experience, when clients have considered these key points during their implementations, they tend to run much smoother and end more successfully compared to those who don't. What I'd like to cover today is really based on numerous observations and lessons learned working with various clients on a multitude of solution implementations. First, to understand how to streamline model design, I want to discuss some of the most common challenges companies in this business might face. The key considerations I want to spend some time exploring in this webinar are the following. Clearly defining a development model purpose, use, or goal. Understanding the development workflow and how it impacts model design and how to identify key decision points. Again, this may not seem groundbreaking, but over the next 30 minutes or so, I hope to demonstrate how considering these things can have a major impact on the way your model design starts and the way it evolves. For the majority of my time in industry, I worked as a development engineer on an asset development team. In that role, I spent the bulk of my time planning out how to develop an asset in the most economically viable way. In my attempts to do that, I've personally experienced these challenges and now as a consultant, I'm often asked to come in to help clients struggling with the same challenges. So to start the presentation, I want to take a quick opportunity to vent because it feels good to get things off your chest, misery loves company, and I'm sure we can all relate to these common issues. The first is that when you're working on developing an asset, oftentimes you just don't know what you don't know. I think there are very few development engineers that know everything about their asset. And, I mean, for many of us, figuring out new methods or development strategies is what makes development roles interesting and exciting. When it comes to building an asset development model, however, we often find that we'll begin to model one way and find out later that the solution won't actually work for various reasons previously unknown. The second problem is the one we all like to complain about the most, tight timelines. This tends to be the age-old feud between management and engineers which begins for many of us back in university. Management needs to make decisions on limited information and often can't wait for the level of understanding the asset team is entirely comfortable with. It seems like the nature of the business is you need to make decisions based on the best information at any given time, and if you're wrong, you don't want it to sink you, so you need to manage the risks. What this causes is more often than not, an asset development team is delivering results while simultaneously building and validating a development model. The last common issue I've come across is the fact that there are many planning tools on the market, and often a team may not have a full understanding of the capabilities of the tool being used while they are trying to model out a plan. This is often what leads to stressed out late nights, the shedding of tears or the pulling out of hair, etc. as you're trying to figure out how to use a tool while working under tight timelines and trying to understand the asset itself all simultaneously. In addition to the challenges mentioned, I think we would all agree that in general, or at least on average, companies in the oil and gas industry are notorious for operating with a lack of planning, especially when times are good. In Canada, we call this the just get her done attitude. Two things that I've experienced and seen that I think come from this is that planning is often reactive as opposed to proactive, and the planning process tends to be painfully cyclical. An asset team is often either chasing a drilling rig or getting locked in time-consuming iterations, presenting a plan to management, and evaluating any changes requested. 
Now, usually as a solutions consultant, I enter the scene at a company somewhere in the midst of all these challenges. Typically, someone somewhere in the company has seen a presentation or a software demo and believes the software may help alleviate some of the pain in the current planning processes, which I believe we actually tend to do. Often we receive various versions of the following requests. For example, we're being asked to run numerous sensitivities and it takes us forever. We need an easier way to do this. Or we have numerous tools we use independently, but we want a single solution to help us build our business plan. Or sometimes more simply, we need an easier way to evaluate the most optimal development plan. These are all great requests and it's our business to help overcome planning challenges. So as a solutions consultant, my task when working with clients is to help them better understand their challenges and design a solution that meets their needs. Ideally, I need to get clients thinking a little bit more about the details. So for those initial requests, some examples could be, you're being asked to run sensitivities, but what information will determine the most economic scenario? What can you control and how will it change? Or getting your dev plan consolidated into a single solution is great. We can help you do that, but what are the key challenges? What do you want? What do you need to deliver and what will determine a good plan? Or you want to find an optimal plan. Well, that's great, but what does optimal mean to you? When the time comes for me to get involved working with a new client on a solution implementation, I've found that usually clients are pretty excited about the capabilities they see in a specific tool and they want to get moving building up a model ASAP. That's great because that's usually the fun and exciting part. But often I've found that a client hasn't considered some basic things that really make an implementation successful or at least help it run more smoothly. Part of my job as a solutions consultant is getting clients to consider these things but I'd like to present them today to get everyone thinking about them in hopes that they could help streamline your planning solutions. So the first thing to consider is defining clear and specific goals. It sounds simple, but you'd be surprised how many clients we see diluting the potency or effectiveness of their planning solution by straying from a clearly defined purpose. I find the reason that this tends to happen is often because sophisticated tools have ever expanding capabilities and when you're building or designing a planning model, it's tempting to build in details just because the tool can handle it. Bells and whistles are always nice, but I'd say it's crucial that you create a balance between utilizing the capabilities of your tool and focusing on value added information. A good way to do this is to continually ask yourself, what specific problem or challenge are you trying to solve? If you don't have a clearly defined goal and challenge, you can waste time and money exploring things you don't necessarily need to explore. Secondly, when designing a development solution, I found it imperative to keep in mind your corporate goals. Typically, management gets passed down targets and goals, and it's the job of the team to translate these into concrete development plans. If you have a good understanding of the corporate goals, you can structure your model in a way that helps you make decisions in line with the direction the company is trying to move. Examples of corporate goals could be minimizing capital spend, accelerating production, or optimizing operational expenses. In my experience, teams that have a clear understanding of corporate goals up front and set up software solutions in a way that focus on evaluating options in line with these goals, they do a lot less redesign and rework later on. At the end of the day, concrete development plans are practical, realizable, or actionable. So for example, minimizing capital spend may translate into dropping a rig from your original plan. When defining the purpose of your model, are the more immediate or asset-specific goals? So for example, are you creating a model to, de to do a deep bottleneck evaluation, or are you creating a full field development plan? Another example could be, are you evaluating facility capacity expansions, or are you trying to find the optimal take or pay option in your field? Having a focused objective leads to better results, period. So it's okay if your development goals change with time, chances are that they will, but when you are participating in a development exercise, it's imperative that you keep clear what the relevant metric is, and you'll want to design your model in a way that makes it easy for you to evaluate this. A clear understanding of a goal or objective helps you design your development solution in a much more focused way. So something that continually comes up with clients is determining the level of detail necessary. Having a clearly defined purpose or challenge to solve helps you determine the amount of detail you need to make a good decision. A common example of a model purpose we see is, we want to model both our short-term and long-term production, capital, and operating cost forecasts. Well, that needs to happen, and everyone does that in some way already, 
you can actually get some very detailed plans capturing a forecast. But if you don't think further about what you will need to do with your model, you can run into issues later where your model is designed in a way that doesn't allow for easy evaluations. An example of a clearer model objective is something like, based on our current development schedule, price assumptions and production, we want to evaluate what's more economic using NPV, building our own processing facility or paying fees at a third party facility. So with the purpose more clearly defined, we can then start determining the relevant information needed to carry out this evaluation. An asset development team uses a detailed process with a lot of moving parts when building a development model or plan. Having a good understanding of the total process you will use when making a decision will have a major impact on the design of your model. Understanding where the model fits and where it will be used within your workflow is critical to design as you need to be able to accept upstream data in an efficient manner and pass results on in a format that makes sense to stakeholders downstream. A simpler way of saying this is you need to identify key information as well as the key stakeholders along the decision path. For example, if you're on an asset development team, your model needs to be designed to accept the inputs required from operations, drilling, completions, land, etc. And you need to understand what people downstream want to see and why. So your team leads, managers, VPs, etc. Understanding the workflow is key to design. As consultants, we tend to spend a lot of time trying to understand this with a client as every company and team has a unique workflow. This chart on this slide doesn't capture everything, but it's intended to get you thinking about how the flow of data can impact the design of your model. I want to take a second here just to run through a specific example from a recent implementation I was involved in. We had a client that wanted to build their operating cost model into one of our solutions. We'd built a model that was going to be used to forecast production, capital, and op costs, and evaluate facility capacities. The production engineers tracked their op costs in a spreadsheet, which we used as a starting point to capture similar operating cost classes. A major issue we ran into was the client did not own the processing facilities in the field 100%, and so the model was initially set up to include third-party volumes used to evaluate facility capacities. The op costs we received from the production engineers did not account for third-party volumes and there was no simple way to model the operating costs at the facility. In addition, a request came in from the finance team that they needed to see operating costs split out for operated wells and non-operated wells. We had to drastically alter the structure of the model to satisfy all the requirements which took a couple extra days. If this was better understood before the model was built, we could have designed it better the first go around and save time and money on redesigning. This example reiterates the second part of the workflow, identifying the stakeholders and what is important to each of them. When we're discussing a solution implementation with a client, we want to know who provides the data, who will be receiving results, and what or how will they be used and why. If we have a clearly defined goal or purpose for the model, having an understanding of this helps us evaluate if, how, or should we should use or provide data. Building a model as a reaction to requests from various teams can be dangerous as trying to please everyone with the same model can distract from your main objective or goal of your model. I'd say this is one of the major contributors to project scope creep that we see. Many of you are likely familiar with the various stakeholders in the development planning workflow, but I've included a couple examples here to get you thinking about it again. Common examples are your asset operations team, finance team, corporate planning team, marketing team, reserves team, executive and management team, and there could be many more teams. The point I'm trying to make here is that different teams have different goals. When you're designing a planning solution, you need to ask yourself, can one model meet everyone's needs or should it? To answer this question, it's very helpful to take the time to consider what everyone's needs are before you start building a model as it will help focus your design. I wanted to provide an example where we had two stakeholders with two very different goals. We had a client where two stakeholders were trying to use a full long range planning model built by the asset planners to generate results for two very different purposes. The marketing team needed production information used for facility nominations. They found that using the LRP model was extremely time consuming, the model was complex and difficult to use, and the outputs were not accurate enough for their nomination exercise. The facilities team needed more detailed information regarding physical flow paths which weren't captured in the LRP model. Also, they didn't need a lot of the capital detail that existed in the LRP model. 
The solution here was to design two leaner models that were based on the original LRP model, with unnecessary details stripped out for their specific purposes. The marketing team needed the model to generate a two-month production forecast to nominate volumes to third parties to secure capacity. The facilities team was trying to evaluate the economics associated solely with two different processing strategies. So again, two very different challenges. Two leaner models worked for these two individual teams, but one key design consideration I should point out when you're simplifying development models to target specific stakeholder needs is it's imperative that you design a method to keep data consistent between models. Many companies are scared to have too many individual models, and rightly so, as you can reach a point where updating and validating can be a nightmare. But I've found that with well thought out intentional design, it is possible to keep model inputs consistent. To do this successfully though, you have to have an understanding about where your input data comes from and how it will be used early on in your design process. So a third thing to consider upfront when designing a model is what are the key decision points and how can I set up the model to help me manipulate variables to evaluate options? In other words, what are the sensitivities that I will need to run? With a good understanding of the workflow, particularly the stakeholders involved and their values, as well as an understanding of the larger goals of the company, spending time considering this will help you anticipate the kinds of questions you will be asked. You'll want to identify what drives the decision and what lever you will need to pull to evaluate different scenarios. Considering different scenarios that you'll need to run has a major impact on your model design, typically how you need to build a base case. A base case must be easily configurable, easily copied and altered. And this is often what's difficult to do in Excel and to be able to track your changes. Also, scenarios should be easily compared back to the base case to see differences in economics, production, schedule, etc. And again, this is often difficult to compare outputs in Excel. So everyone's familiar with a lot of these uh, examples of different sensitivities, especially in our current market conditions, but I just want to throw up a couple common sensitivities for you to review. Most common, I would say, are changes in price, changes in capital, uh, production changes, op costs, and egress or processing. When you're designing a planning solution, it has to be set up in a way that allows you to easily control these variables and generate results quickly and as painlessly as possible. As I've mentioned, an effective asset development team is able to translate general, high-level corporate strategies into concrete, executable business plans, which can then be used to evaluate individual strategies or decisions. It's crucial that you're able to quantify the value of business decisions. Many will be familiar with these, but I want to lay out some common questions management tends to bring up and discuss the impact it can have on the design of a development solution. Very common one, especially now, is if you had X amount more or less capital, what could you deliver? The impact this can have on your model is you want a model where it's easy to increase or decrease the capital available to calculate out a development plan. The lever you're pulling here is total capital. We had a client recently that was asked to run a case where minimum capital was spent to avoid lease expiries. Well, luckily we had designed our model so we were able to easily alter our well inventory and create the case very quickly. Another common one is product prices. If product prices change by X, what would the impact be on project economics? This is a very common sensitivity. Again, and I'm sure everyone's really familiar with this one, especially lately but a well-designed model will allow you to generate economic summaries at multiple price settings and requires the ability to compare back to a base case. Another example is if more or less resources are available, what impact would it have on development? So a common example of this is what will development look like if you have different drilling rigs, if you have a different amount of completion crews or water available for your fracks. Again, any model you want to build has to be able to evaluate this easily. A couple other examples that I'll just go over quickly is A and D. So if you're evaluating what is the asset worth or also what is the economically viable development approach. Um, drill to fill, lease maintenance or farm in or farm out options. The point is each model evaluates a different development strategy which therefore requires a unique design. When you consider what scenarios you may be asked, you can set up your model in a way that makes it easy to generate these scenarios. So when clients don't spend time planning out their planning model, 
I found they are more susceptible to falling into some common traps that I'd just like to run through right now. The first is that companies are often in a rush to build a model for a specific purpose, like annual reserves, annual business development plan, annual budget, or quarterly production forecasts. The trap is that building a quick fix model tends to lead to significant rework or complete overhaul often uh, at a later date. Another common trap is when companies build an unnecessarily complex model. So as mentioned, usually this comes from including details because you can. And often after building a detailed short-term project, teams want to extrapolate that into an entire LRP model. Again, considering the required level of detail here is crucial. A third trap we see a lot of companies fall into is that they are expanding the functionality of a model on the fly and as they go. So again, to avoid this, I would stress asking yourself what's the problem you're trying to solve to keep your design focused. Asset teams are often rich in technical experience and as a result, there are many experts in individual technical fields. When working with all of these experts, it's important to resist the urge to develop tunnel vision on the asset. It will help when you're designing a planning solution to look up and around and be more cognizant of your surroundings. Laterally, we should be aware of the other departments, tools, or data that both feed into our model and take our outputs as their inputs. And vertically, we must be aware of senior management's needs and corporate strategies, as both will have a significant impact on the architecture of the model we are building. So for instance, the same asset would have a very different strategy and target if it belongs to a major IOC versus if it belongs to a junior whose entire portfolio is dependent on this asset. So I'm hoping I was able to get you to start thinking about how to design a planning solution. At 3ESI Intersight, we're trying to help clients with their solution design and provide tools to do so. I think it is important to note that software is merely a tool. A good tool can help make processes and business decisions easier and more accurate, however it cannot replace the value of a well thought out or designed planning process. Every company is different. Every asset is different. A good tool should be flexible enough to solve different problems for different companies. However, there is no cookie cutter out of the box solution for all of your questions. It may sound funny, but the more you can plan out your planning model, the better off you'll be. Thinking through the purpose of your model, where it fits in the decision workflow, and considering the various sensitivities you'll likely need to run up front before building anything will drastically improve the resulting solution and will help you streamline your planning process. So that's all I want to share today. Thank you again for attending this webinar. We hope it gets you thinking about how to design your upcoming planning model or maybe gives you some ideas on how to improve your existing solution. Great, thanks Josh. We'll now open up the floor to any questions that came in through the presentation. So we have a couple in front of us that we're going to read out to the group. So question number one, you mentioned earlier in the presentation uh, an example of converting an LRP model into two more specific models. Could you speak to how you can keep the multiple models up to date without losing consistency between them? Okay, well, that's a great question and a very common challenge for a lot of our clients, actually. Um, what worked for us in this specific case was ensuring that each model was able to accept input data in the same format. So focusing a lot on that, it allowed the client to update data in just the LRP model and then easily copy or export that data into the simplified models. So I'd say the key to keeping a model cons models consistent is just ensuring that the inputs and the outputs are very consistent. Great. Um, so the second question, you discussed identifying different stakeholders in a workflow. Uh, could you share how you're able to balance the different needs of the various teams in an organization? All right. Well, I'd say I guess the best way to balance different needs is to involve as many teams as possible into the solution planning process. So that could be having multiple planning meetings where you try to explain what you're trying to accomplish with whatever solution you're implementing and then inviting as much input as possible. Um, yeah, we find doing that up front can really help you manage those from the get-go. Awesome. So thanks for giving us those great examples, Josh. Uh, this brings us to the end of today's presentation. Thanks so much for joining us and we hope to see you at the next presentation in our webinar series.